Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second installment of our spring seminar series hosted by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. Each year, we invite some of the leading international scholars working in Hellenic studies to present their research on a wide range of Hellenic topics, including archeology, span classics, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as literary and cultural studies. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event uh, was organized at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Salatooth, Musqueam, and Quiquitlam peoples. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about SFU Zoom privacy and security guidelines, I would ask you to visit the SFU IT Services website. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will host a Q&A session. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, and we'll try our best to address them all afterwards. If you would like to ask a question verbally, please use the raise your hand button and our event coordinator will unmute you. I am now pleased to present uh, Dr. Angelos Delahanis. Angelos Delahanis is a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research based at the Institute of Early Modern and Modern History in Paris. He holds a PhD in history from the European University Institute Florence and was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. His research interests include history of migration, business, labor, and Greek diaspora in the Eastern Mediterranean in the modern period. He is the author of the Greek Exodus from Egypt, Diaspora of Politics and Emigration, 1937 through 1962, and co-editor with Vincent Lemire of Ordinary Jerusalem, 1840 through 1940, opening new archives, revisiting a global city. I hope you all enjoyed today's presentation. Now, please give a warm uh, welcome to Angelos. Uh, good morning from Paris. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dimitris Kravitz for inviting me to present my work at this uh, seminar of the Stavros Niachos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies, and James uh, Honcastle, of course, for uh, his kind introduction. Uh, before I start talking about the ladies of Jerusalem, I'd like to say uh, a few things, uh, a few words about the intellectual background uh, of uh, this uh, work. Uh, the PhD dissertation I defended at the European University Institute uh, focused on the Greek community of Egypt, the largest foreign ethnic group in the country, and one of the most important uh, communities of the Greek diaspora during the 19th century uh, until mid 20th century. Uh, I was particularly interested in the causes uh, of the mass departure of the Greeks from Egypt uh, and how they dealt uh, with the rapid uh, political and social transformation of Egypt on its path uh, to full uh, independence. Uh, after defending my thesis and before its publication, in English and in Greek, my postdoctoral research uh, began to focus more and more on the Suez Canal region and especially on the Greek presence in the city of uh, Port Said, Ismailia, and uh, Suez. Then, from 2014 to 2019, I was associated with a European Union funded project, uh, Open Jerusalem, uh, a project on the archives uh, of, uh, and the history of Jerusalem from 1840 to 1940. Uh, and I was uh, especially working on the Greeks archives uh, of uh, Jerusalem uh, for uh, that uh, period. This work led to a collective volume that you can see here, I co-edited with uh, Vincent Lemire, uh, published by Brill, which is, and it is also available online, uh, completely uh, free access. So after my experience in both uh, Jerusalem and uh, Egypt, I start thinking more and more about the links between Egypt and Palestine and uh, I've been wondering if it was uh, pertinent to think uh, of Near Eastern space outside uh, Pan-Arabism and Zionism and, or Turkish uh, uh, nationalism. 
My question was, uh, can the Greek diaspora offer us a different uh, paradigm to rethink the history of the Middle East, uh, uh, not uh, just as a story of uh, separate states, but in more global terms? Even if I am aware of the difficulties of this perspective, the paper I'm presenting today, which is the basis of an article that will be published in a few months, in a few months uh, should be understood uh, uh, from this perspective. Well, on 6 August 1944, Greek Ladies' Union of Jerusalem named uh, the Odigitria, the guide, uh, an invocation that refers to Virgin Mary, celebrated its 20th anniversary. In their speeches at the occasion, both the Union's president and the president of the Greek Kinotita of the city uh, praised uh, a woman, uh, Fotini Mavromichali, for her valuable work and awarded her the title of the President and Merit of the Union. In her address, Mavromichali said light to the on the founding and the early years of the Union's existence, the emotional shock generated by the mass exodus from Asia Minor of over a million Greeks in a needy and often desperate condition after the defeat of the Greek army by the army of Kemal Atatürk in 1922 triggered the union's creation. While her initial aim was to create an association to provide aid to the refugees arriving in Greece, after discussions with other community members, Mavro Mihaly decided to focus on the destitute Greeks of Jerusalem. Even if this seems like a choice between two different options, I argue that they were both linked to the Greek effort for national rehabil rehabilitation as of the line uh, Psara put it in their article, uh, that is the healing of the Greek population's psychological and physical wounds and the consequences of the state for the state after what is known in the Greek language as the Mikrasiatiki catastrophe, Asia Minor catastrophe. So what did national rehabilitation signify in the context of Jerusalem in 1924? How was a ladies philanthropic association related to the national cause and why? And why did a women's association devote, develop a national character rather uh, than a strictly religious one in Jerusalem? And how was this accomplished in the Palestine context of the British mandate, which included the outbreak of the Arab Zionist conflict and the Second World War? To address this issue is issues, I will focus on the minutes of uh, the Greek Ladies' Union covering the last 10 years of the British mandate. These minutes, part of the Greek Room Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem archives, bring to us unheard voices of Jerusalem and the Greek community, whose institutional life is almost exclusively linked to the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of the city. An analysis of these minutes allows us to examine the philanthropic activities of the Union within the Greek Rim Orthodox charitable universe of the so-called Holy City, and most importantly, their connections, their connection to different political developments uh, uh, during a period which is sensitive regarding the future, not only of Palestine, but also of the Christian communities of Jerusalem. I will examine how the Union was structured and how it was connected uh, to the institutional and political context of Palestine and beyond. The Union's philanthropic activities, I argue, were mainly destined for three different, though overlapping ge geographical areas without chronological, chronological order. The Middle East, Jerusalem, and Greece. The way in which the Union differentiated its activities regarding each of these areas provide evidence for the secularization process the Union underwent through the period under scrutiny. I will start by placing uh, the Greek presence in Jerusalem in the wider context of the Greek population of the Middle East, to whom I refer here as the Eastern Greeks, uh, to show how this context affected the foundation of the Ladies' Union. I will then examine how the association functioned uh, while remaining anchored in Jerusalem, and also how Greece as a real or imaginary homeland came to the fore in the 40s as the dominant reference uh, of the Union's activity. 
um, well, this uh, slide should be here, I think. Yeah, that's better now. Well, the term Eastern Greeks that I'm using does not uh, necessarily or exclusively refer to people of Greek nationality living as a diaspora in the Middle East. The Greek presence in the region historically originated from three different population movements. The merchant diaspora communities settled around the Mediterranean and the Black Sea since the 17th century until the mid 19th century. The mobility within the Ottoman Empire and between the Ottoman Empire and, CIS and its uh, successor states. And uh, third, emigration from the Greek state after its foundation in 1830. Therefore, an Eastern Greek could be any Greek speaking Orthodox, Catholic, Jew, or Muslim. Additionally, a person, for instance, from the Balkans or from Albania living, for instance, in Egypt, they could just as easily be considered as an Eastern Greek if he felt closer to the Greek community than to the Albanians. Um, one sense of belonging is not uh, always in line with one's uh, nationality, whether it be Greek or the nationality of uh, Western European or individual in a Middle Eastern uh, country. In any case, determining who was Greek in Jerusalem or in other Middle Eastern settings emerging from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire was not always easy to define. Eastern Greeks in the majority were located in Asia Minor, but they also lived in Palestine, Persia, and Egypt uh, during Ottoman times, but also after 1922. Even if the fall of the Ottomans uh, did not have the same devastating effects on Greeks outside the borders of today's Turkey as it had on those within it, the end of the Greek presence in Asia Minor denoted that the existence of Greeks in Palestine might also be at stake for three main reasons. First, because their professional, ecclesiastical and kinship networks were closely related to the Greeks of Asia Minor, since many Greeks of Palestine came from there. Second, because the Greeks of Asia Minor, either as pilgrims or new migrants, regularly boosted the demographics of Palestine rather small Greek community. Actually, in 1922, the 1,230 persons who, who habitually spoke the Greek language lived in Palestine, out of whom uh, 760 were in Jerusalem. By 1931, their number in Palestine increased to around uh, 1,700, most probably because of refugees from Asia Minor who arrived there. According to Papastathis, Kostadinos Papastathis, at the end of the Second World War, 2,000 Greek speakers lived, lived in Palestine, out of which uh, um, 1,500 resided in Jerusalem. About 3,000 Jewish Greeks who migrated to Palestine are not included, of course, in this number. A third reason is related to the Megalidea, the great idea. The great idea was uh, an irredentist doctrine advocating the expansion of the Greek state so as to encompass all ethnic Greeks uh, settled in the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Even if it was not, it was unfeasible for Greece to expand its frontiers in the Eastern Mediterranean before 1922. The existence of Greek populations in the major commercial and religious urban centers in the Middle East was bound to play a subsidiary economic and symbolic role. Consequently, the collapse of the great idea in 1922 would inevitably shrink the importance of these populations for Greece. In addition to these reasons external to the Palestinian milieu, other factors related to the local context could also endanger the survival of these Eastern Greeks. The singularities of Orthodoxy's structure in Jerusalem made local Greeks feel uncertain about the survival of their community. The Greek Orthodox congregation in Jerusalem included mostly Palestinian Arabs and a small number of Greeks. However, due to historical factors, the Greek clergy controlled the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre, 
And therefore, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, one of the biggest private landowners in Palestine then and even today. Greeks constantly refer to the Arabs as Arabic speaking Orthodox, insinuating that they were not genuine Arabs, but Christian Greeks who had been alienated from their ethnic origin and Arabicized over the centuries. Dr. Nikolaos Spiridonos, a prominent member of the Greek community and the president of the Greek colony from 1922 to 1925, summarized his view uh, on the matter in the following way. I have lived in Jerusalem for the last 58 years as a doctor of the Greek Orthodox people and the patriarchate of the last 40 years. I have known indigenous Arabic speaking families born in different places like Evia, Constantinople, Asia Minor and the islands who were discolored over time and they are now called Ulad al-Arab, that is children of the Arabs because of the milieu to which they adapted. How is it possible for people of Arab origin, for Muslims in the center of Muslim fanaticism to become a humane Christians and to have Orthodox descendants today? So the possible transformation of Greeks into Arabs or according to Spiridonos into people who did not know to what nation they belong was considered a constant threat to the Greek community and Greek control over the patriarchate. According to Spiridonos, several political and religious uh, propagandists uh, with aspirations to prevail over the Holy Land, uh, like Protestants, Catholics, uh, Russians, had purposefully and successfully cultivated this confusion. His views reflect mistrust uh, towards Arabs, uh, Orthodox and other Christians, and were widespread within the secular and uh, religious uh, part of Jerusalem's uh, Greek populations in the early 1920s. These views justified in their eyes the privileged position of the Greeks within the Brotherhood, the protection of the holy places by the patriarchy, and the marginalization of the Arabs within the Greek Orthodox community. The end of the Great War and the collapse of the Russian and Ottoman empires would further alarm the Greeks about their long-term prospects in Jerusalem for two main reasons. First, the increasing financial difficulties the Patriarchate faced after the Russian Revolution and the loss of the church financial support. And second, the sectarian policy of the British mandate. In fact, the British wanted to the Palestinian communities to be more religion than ethnicity oriented. Upon their, arri their arrival, they imposed their own version of the Ottoman millet system. The legal separation of the communities along religious lines uh, sharpened all their differences, despite the fact that the British pretended to be an impartial mediator between them. Through the 20s, the Christian Palestinian nationalist movement changed the character to become more Arab Orthodox in tone. And its major claim was to contest Greek supremacy over the patriarchate and its real estate portfolio. This was not a novel claim. It dated back to the late 19th century and was already created conflict and had already created conflict between Christian Arabs and Greeks. This conflict persisted during the mandate period when the British administration supported Christian Arabs against the Greek hierarchy of the patriarchate. For much of the mandate period, actually, Palestinian Christians considered the Greeks to be their enemies on the same level as the British and the Zionists. This internal conflict in the Orthodox Church only eased after the Palestinians failed to win the 1931 patriarchal uh, election. So the need to deal with all these external and internal, real and imaginary threats to Jerusalem was reflected in the local Greek community's initiative to create numerous secular associations along national lines. From 1921 to 1924, five different associations were created in the city. The Greek Scouts in 1921, the male Greek Charitable Brotherhood the same year, the Greek club a year later, the Terpandros Musical Society in 1923, 
and finally the, the Yitria Greek Ladies' Union in 1924. The institutionalization of the Greek presence around the structure other than the patriarchate and the consolidation of the national feeling of solidarity were related to the need for a collective national identification. Thus, the Greeks sought to keep equal distance from both the Arab co congregation and the Western European influence in order not to lose their, what they called, Greekness. For the name of and other Greek women's initiative uh, to create a union needs to be understood within this wider context and the increasing awareness of the Greek community that its existence was at risk. In a city which is almost synonymous with charity, Greek women committed themselves to a mission that had been up to that moment only in the hands of religious and secular institutions exclusively run by men. Until 1921, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate was the only charitable institution of the Greek Rome Orthodox population, both Arab and Greek. In that same year, the Greek Charitable Brotherhood was founded by men who served the same patriotic commitment and opened the path for the institutionalization of charity along national lines. The Ladies' Union was not an auxiliary association to this male-run organization. Within the critical regional and local context, the role of women became more and more central and assumed a twofold objective. To remove some financial burden from the patriarchate, which was experiencing important economic difficulties, and to protect from imaginary threats and nurture the existing Greek population in order to ensure the preservation of its national identity. The latter was even truer for the most vulnerable members of the community, especially poor women, the sick and the destitute, who were not few in number. All these persons had to remain close to their national nucleus and not leave the city or seek help from other Christian charitable institutions. Similarly, to the defeat of Greece in the 1897 war against the Ottoman Empire, the nation, compared to a large family, was in urgent need of the motherly nurturing of women, as Avdela and Sarah uh, put it. This seems to have been happened, to have happened again in the Jerusalem context of the early 20s. From its foundation, the Ladies' Union became part of the city's lively charitable scene, where the Muslim philanthropic presence, for example, was much stronger than that in the other major Middle Eastern cities, like Istanbul, Damascus, or Cairo. Jerusalem's other religions and faiths also hosted a great number of women's charities and humanitarian Christian missions. Palestinian women also established charitable associations around 1919-1921, such as the Salt Lake Arab Ladies Club, in order to serve the national Palestinian cause. So the Greek Ladies' Union also became, became part of the wider uh, charitable context of Eastern Greeks in the Ottoman uh, Empire and the post, uh, in the post-Ottoman world. Voluntary associations and women's philanthropy in particular were widespread in the Ottoman context uh, from Istanbul to Cairo. From 86 to 1861 to 1922, women created 60 out of the almost 500 voluntary associations of Istanbul's Greek community. Charitable activities were often women's only possibility, actually, to enter the public sphere monopolized by men. A more rigorous presence of women in the public sphere was high on the list of demands of Middle Eastern feminist groups at that time. Additionally, the number of voluntary associations increased in times of distress in order to mitigate the plight of the destitute and needy. A mushrooming of such initiatives came from the Great War in Europe, but also in the post-Ottoman Eastern Mediterranean, even though many of them proved so lived. Thus, the women's activities may be seen as an extension of the charitable activities that initially took place in the war context. 
The Greek Ladies' Union was not the first association of Greek women to be created in a previously Arab province of the Ottoman Empire. In 1917, middle and upper class uh, women in Alexandria created the Union of Greek Women of Egypt, which five years later was renamed the Union of Greek Women of Alexandria. Despite the rich initiative, uh, the rich associative uh, life of the Greek Orthodox population in Arab, Arab areas, actually there is particularly no or very limited scholarly discussion on the question of charity, partly because of the absence or of difficulty of access to relevant uh, archival material. The Union's connections to the Greek state are confirmed by the fact that the Greek consul himself was the president emeritus of the Union from 1924 to 1938. At that year, in 1938, the Union merged with the Greek Kinotita. This marked the beginning of the second phase in the Union's life, which changed in its name to Ladies Charity Department of the Kinotita. Its new name and logo marked a shift uh, it's marked the shift towards a more secular identity as the name of the Yidria attributed uh, to the Virgin Mary was dropped. Until late 1938, the seat of the Union was the convent of St. Uh, Ephemius in the old city of Jerusalem, which also held its records. Up, down. In many cases, however, board meetings were held in the house of a member of the union's administrative uh, committee. However, after the merger between the union and the Greek Kinotita of Jerusalem, its seat moved to the Kinotita building in Katamon, in a quarter of uh, outside the old city of Jerusalem. And the institutionalization became more evident uh, as a comparison between its previous and new seal demonstrates. I mean, the first, as you can see here, uh, shows an everyday scene of a woman uh, taking care of an old lady and small uh, child, uh, probably an orphan. Whereas on the second seal, a Greek royalist coat of arms is combined with a double-headed eagle symbol of the, also of the Orthodox uh, Church. After the merger, the consul became the president emeritus of the Kinotita, according to the tradition of form the former association, that is the Greek club, uh, the, the association called FTEA, Beneficence, and the Greek uh, colony. During the Second World War, the title of president emerita of the Union was attributed to the wife of the Greek consul. The absence of particular relations with the city's uh, Greek Orthodox Patriarchate shows the strong relations the Union members had or wanted to create with the Greek state. The consul and his wife's uh, presidencies added authority and status to the Union and legitimated its purposes. In addition, it symbolized the strong relations between the two associations. Besides, the consulate was the most important sponsor of the union and the honorary president participated in, gener in the general assemblies of the union. Only with the end of the Second World War was the role of President Emeritus or Emerita entrusted to non council uh, as such as uh, Fotini uh, Mavro Michali. So who are the founding members of the, of the union who became its members? And, and who were those who benefited from its activities. It is evident that the lay women who created the union, those who later became its members, were close to the church, with some of them living engaged, uh, having engaged in religious life uh, to an extent. Most were of Greek nationality or origin. According to the seventh article of the Union's Constitution, only women of Greek nationality, wives of Greek men and women of Greek origin, even if they uh, when married uh, to foreign men, had the right to vote and stand for leadership positions. 
Well, since there was, well, there was no precedent for a Greek female association in uh, Jerusalem, I don't think that I have shared my screen there. So let's set. Okay. It is noteworthy that the union was not built on the organizational model of similar female associations or of other ethnic or religious groups in Jerusalem, but of other Greek institutions located outside Palestine. In Greece, at that time, there were numerous charitable associations engaged in different kinds of activity and could serve as a source of inspiration. The neighboring Egypt hosted from 1922 the largest settlement, as I said, of Greeks outside Greece and had a very rich institutional life. For this reason, the Union of Greek Ladies of Alexandria, which had both an educational and a charitable mission, functioned as a model for its Jerusalem counterpart. The Jerusalem Union statutes had not yet been found, so it's possible that some archives of the Union were kept in the member's house or that the 1948 battles resulted in losses. Based on the example of Egypt, Greek women over the age of 21 resident in Jerusalem could become regular members. Men could join as auxiliary members but did not have the right to vote or hold any other position. With regard to those who could benefit from the union's support, the names on the recipients lists and the way in which the aid was distributed demonstrates that they were mainly religious women of Greek origin and always Orthodox. Men's names also appear on the list, but it seems like they were uh, widowers. It is as if the union had the role of the missing mother or, or uh, wife. In general, however, the union mostly satisfied the needs of destitute women, elderly and incapable of looking after themselves, uh, unemployed, sick or disabled, and widows, regardless of whether they had uh, children. The members, the founders, uh, uh, were often the spouses of men from medical professions. In addition to their medical work, uh, some of these husbands actively participated in other Greek associations, contributed to the establishment of connections between these associations and the union. Uh, of course, this kind of connection was not to be found exclusively in Jerusalem, but also in other cities such as Istanbul or Alexandria. The different examples we have, and I'm not going to present here in details, unveil a microcosm woven, woven through kinship and other networks. It is evident that the female members of the union had the financial resources, along with the cultural and professional capital and sensitivity, to engage in an ethnic-oriented philanthropy. What is also worth mentioning is that the line of succession established in the same families over almost uh, 30 years. If there, was, if there was no daughter in a family, a daughter-in-law was often involved with charity and the husband's active role in communal affairs certainly facilitated the initiative to create the union. It is also quite clear that friends and kinship ties bound these ladies, or at least some of them, Close ties among women of similar social background must have been a unifying force behind the organization and the possibility to meet on a social or charitable basis uh, and must have certainly nursed their enthusiasm. The links among members included adherence to the same national ethnic group and religious denomination or belonging to the same family. Well, indeed, in a number of instances, a tradition of philanthropy was established over generations within uh, a family. So the ladies of the union faced a major question, who was to benefit from the aid and uh, work? The beneficiaries list leads to some answers. In 1938, the union employed 13 workers who were paid to design or make embroideries. Two of them were nuns, one was a widow, and two were married with families, while the status of the rest is unclear. All of them 
seem to have been living in houses owned by the Patriarchate and run by the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre. All these women also appear in the list of regular or occasional beneficiaries of the Union. During the Union's early period, almost all regular beneficiaries were women and received uh, monthly aid. In 1938, the list included 32 women, widows, sick, elderly, or unemployed, and only three men. The beneficiaries could have been laywomen or men and nuns, but never monks. The destitute Orthodox Christians of the city, either Arabs or Greeks, could live rent-free at the Patriarchate's small houses and the convents located in the old city of Jerusalem at the time. On religious holidays, especially Christmas, Easter, and the celebration of Virgin Mary's birth in September, more beneficiaries were added uh, to the lists. The only details we know about the beneficiaries are their names, their place of residence, and their monastic status, status if any. The poor who were eligible for aid were mostly women, and the men who received it are presented as willing to work but unable to do so because of illness, age, or lack of opportunity. In almost all cases, aid was given to people of Greek uh, origin, as suggested by their names, with the exception of the Russian women mentioned in the 1938 uh, minutes. Well, the union's activities were threefold, collecting money, maintaining logistics, which were necessary to the smooth running of the union, and distributing money and other philanthropy to people in need. The revenues mainly derived from three sources, regular subscribers' uh, contributions, donations, and purchases from members of or individuals close to the union. The union also benefited from, donation from, from donations from state institutions, such as the Greek uh, consulate, which was replaced by the British mandate uh, uh, government in Palestine uh, during uh, the war. Uh, I, I should probably skip some of these because, uh, uh, well, I don't think we don't have. So, fine. Well, let's go back. Let's go now to the relationship with uh, Greece. Um, which is, as I showed in the beginning of the article, one important uh, factor in the creation uh, uh, of the Union. That is to ensure the continuation of the Greek secular presence uh, in the Middle East. Um, apart from the financial and other aid that the Union provided to the destitute Greeks of the city under normal circumstances, the political and geopolitical context in Jerusalem gave plenty of reasons for the Union to give a helping hand to Greek people when needed. Such an instance was the Arab revolt between 1936 and 1939 against the British army, when Jerusalem became the scene of violent actions followed by widespread unemployment. The Second World War was an even more bewildering period for the community. The war signified for Palestine the suspension of conflicts between Arabs, Jews, and British, and launched a period of uh, prosperity for the arrival of thousands of allied uh, soldiers uh, propelled the economic activities, as actually had happened at the same time uh, in Egypt. A side effect of the economic boom was a general rise in prices, which increased poverty and made, uh, and made wage earners even more vulnerable to the cost of living. And the war was uh, a very difficult period for Greece, as we all know, and the Union find itself uh, heavily involved uh, with its effects from the very beginning. A few days after uh, the breakout of the Greek-Italian War in 1940, the Ladies' Union invited all Greek women of the city to constitute a local committee for the soldiers' charity 
to produce clothing and frontline soldiers uh, following the FANELA uh, initiative, which was started in Athens in 1939 by women to help the soldiers of Greece's uh, northern frontiers. Well, with the beginning of the Second World War, this initiative uh, uh, was placed under the auspice of uh, Frederica, uh, Frederiki, Greece's uh, uh, princess. So women all over Greece and the diaspora were mobilized uh, to prepare clothing for the poorly equipped uh, Greek soldiers who were fighting the Italian army at, on the mountainous northwestern front in Epirus, uh, especially during the winter of 1940 uh, Overall, hundreds of thousands of persons were sent to the front. Uh, uh, until 1941, when the Germans invaded Greece uh, from the north. So a local association of the diaspora integrated a wider philanthropic scope related to the homeland. And soon enough, the board of the union decided to suspend all activities and to focus on the Fanella uh, initiative. In practice, this meant that the workers of the union would then be paid for the needlework either by ladies who cannot work or by the treasury of the union. And the national cause transcended community boundaries and more people, even non-members, were integrated in the activities. This is how, how women became part of the imagined national body, uh, which was not only struggling for the nation's uh, survival in the Middle East, but also uh, in the homeland. Uh, this was not the only time the Union got involved in the affairs of the motherland. Indeed, uh, thousands of people of Greek nationality or origin moved from mainland Greece, especially from the islands, the Middle East and Africa, to escape from the Axis occupation. This movement not only concerned the people, but also the king and the Greek government, which after the German invasion went into exile in Cape Town and then in Cairo where they remained until the end of the war. So according to the Greek state estimations, in 1944, around 24,000 men, women, and children who had left their place for origin in Greece were residing in the refugee camps in Palestine, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, but also in Ethiopia, the Belgian Congo, and other uh, African uh, uh, countries. Uh, a total of around 1,000 people, 1,000 Greeks, were hosted uh, in Jerusalem. The living conditions were acceptable in some camps, but problems arose uh, in some others. For instance, women reported harassment in Jerusalem, refugee accommodations, as we can see, in, uh, as I found in a, in a document uh, of the Israeli state uh, archives. And the mixed committee of officers and civilians was uh, uh, responsible uh, for these uh, camps. Other national and international organizations were also involved in the refugee relief, along with the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate itself. And uh, for this reason, uh, the Union did not uh, intervene, intervene uh, heavily, except for urgent or exceptional cases such as a pregnant woman who received special aid along with other uh, uh, refugees. So let me conclude. Well, the last uh, date mentioned in the union's uh, minutes is uh, 8 October 1950. However, according to the website of the Patriarchate today, the Odigitria Charitable Women's Association is one of the few Greek charity associations still active uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Is this the same association that was established in 1924 and uh, I described in this uh, paper? This is very likely, even if it is not clear when the association reverted to its initial name, to the Yitria. The second name switch testifies to the absence of a strong secular institution today, but this has been the case since almost 1949, since when the Patriarchate 
has remained the main institutional pole around which the community could gather. Under the British mandate, the available sources allows us to trace the path of women's charity activities during a crucial, a crucial period for Palestine. This paper tries to contribute to the discussion on charity in the countries that emerged from the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire because women's philanthropic activity has remained largely unknown, mainly due to the lack of sources. The study of the Ladies' Union of Jerusalem offers the opportunity to approach this topic since the union was not an isolated phenomenon. It was part of a vivid movement of women belonging to different congregations in Palestine since the 1910s. And women participated as active agents in the lives of their respective communities. This movement was present in charity associations, but also with regard to Palestinian women in protests against the British mandate and Jewish immigration. The activities of charitable associations were entangled with the emergence and consolidation of nation states in the Eastern Mediterranean after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the Great Idea in 1922. Even if the British promoted sectarianism across religious lines, the example of the Greek community and the Ladies' Union clearly shows that this policy could have the reverse effect. Given their fear of losing control over religious institutions and of being absorbed by the bigger Arabic community, the Greeks created associations along national lines, the union being just one of them. Hardly any non-Greeks benefited from the association and almost all the union's collaborations were uh, with other Greek institutions and people not only in Jerusalem, but also in Tel Aviv, Haifa, Ismailia, Alexandria, in Egypt, Amman, uh, Tehran, and Athens. This perimeter of action concerned secular institutions and compatriots in the homeland and in diaspora settings around the Middle East and beyond. The nationalization of the Union was paired with its gradual secularization throughout the mandate period, as the evidence uh, showed. And this was palpable in the status, name, and seal of the Union but was also related to its location from the old city of uh, the St. Artemis Monastery, the Union seat moved to the Greek colony in Catamon. In other words, from the old city, which constituted, which constituted the religious center, the Union moved to a place that became during the same period, the secular core of uh, Jerusalemite Greeks until the Palestine war, when time seems to have stopped for them. Between 30 November 1937 and 31 of July 1949, there are no minutes of any union activities, which apparently has to do with the fights in the Catamon district of Jerusalem during the war. After this silence, new elements appear within the new geopolitical order. The Greek community split between Trust Jordan and Israel, uh, and this also concerned the union's members. From that point onwards, the Union carried on its activities in the old city. Removed from the Catamon facilities uh, in the new geography of Palestine, the bazaars and celebrations of the Union were now organized in the Red End Hall of the Citadel Hotel, which is close to the Jaffa Gate uh, and the uh, old city of uh, Jerusalem, the facilities of the Fair des Ecoles Chrétiens, uh, or in Amman where some key persons of the Union, such as Fotinim Avromichali, established themselves after the war. And the existing Greek community then was demographically boosted with Greeks from Jerusalem. At the 1950 meeting, the Union's board acknowledged that it was in a very difficult situation. Cleo F. Cleavy, which was, who was the last treasurer of the Union before the war, remained in the Israeli-controlled part of the city and had not managed even to send the contents of the Union's treasury before the end of 1949. Other evidence of the Union's limited financial aid emerges in that in 1950. It comprised 32 ordinary members compared to the 64 of 12 years earlier. One of its last decisions 
was to reduce the financial aid to beneficiaries in order to survive in, the, in this new era for the region the union had no option but to appropriate again its religious character and to remain close to the greek orthodox patriarchy thank you so much for this thank you so much for a fascinating talk um, everybody you learned quite a bit from this quite fascinating how you're able to link all these different elements together it's truly remarkable scholarship I would also like to thank the audience for attending. And just as a couple of reminders, uh, please complete the post-event survey. This will be e emailed to you in a couple of days along with the link to the recording of today's talk. And our next event will be held on Friday, February 26th at 2.30. And we'll feature Stephen Shoemaker from the University of Oregon. Uh, register on our website or email directly hscom at sfu.ca. Once again, I would like to thank you for a fascinating talk. And everybody, have a great weekend. And hopefully the weather is nicer where you're at than it is in Vancouver right now. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you.